Father, we come to you in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, we're so thankful we can uh, just let our hair down tonight, God, that we can take the masks off, God, and put down the facades, Lord. None of us is cool. None of us is smart. None of us is anything without you, Lord. We need you. And so, God, I humble myself on my knees before you tonight, God, and I would ask, Lord, that beyond the words that I speak, that everyone here, including myself, would hear the voice of God for their individual lives. Lord, give us eyes that see, ears that hear, hearts that have a good understanding. May we be the good ground where the word is sown, and may it produce fruit in each and every one of our individual lives. Lord, we thank you, God, that tonight your Holy Spirit is the teacher of the church. Give us your vision, your wisdom, your instruction, your direction, even the correction we need for our lives. God, if we're off course, adjust our course to get back on track with where you would have us to be. Lord, we don't just ask this blessing upon ourselves. Also, we'd ask it for our brothers and sisters around the planet that are preaching and hearing the gospel. Many places tonight are having the midweek refresh. God, we ask your blessing upon all of the churches that are meeting and preaching the gospel tonight, Lord. In Jesus' mighty name, God, also, we don't forget our persecuted brothers and sisters scattered abroad throughout the world. We ask that you protect them, you bless them, you deliver them, encourage them, strengthen them, God. May they endure to the end to the glory of God. And God, I want to say a special prayer tonight for the people of Italy, God, that have been ravaged by this earthquake, Lord, that you just comfort their hearts, God, that those that are alive in that rubble be found, God, and that you bring about salvation, bring about your goodness through this horrible situation, God. You are the one who can raise up beauty from ashes. And so, Lord, we thank you that you bless the precious people of Italy. In Jesus' mighty name, we're all in agreement. We say... Amen. Tonight, the title of the message is One Simple Word. Write it down because you need to understand this word. You need to have a focus on this word as a Christian in your life. The one word is simply this, others. Others. Mark chapter 10, turn there with me if you will. Jesus is traveling with his disciples And as he's traveling, things are taking place, things are happening, Uh, the disciples are just in awe of what's going on. In fact, we'll read about it in Mark chapter number 10, how the disciples uh, just looked at what's going on. And um, Jesus has been teaching, Jesus has been doing miracles, Jesus has been doing signs and wonders. And now in Mark chapter 10, starting in verse number 32, we read, it says, Now they were on the road going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus was going before them, and they were amazed. And as they followed, they were afraid. Then he took the 12 aside again and began to tell them the things that would happen to him. Now, I noticed something about the disciples, that they were in a position where they were following Jesus. And in this position of following Jesus, there was both fear as well as awe that took place in their life. I mean, I can only imagine the roller coaster of emotions and experiences that the disciples went through as they traveled with Jesus. One moment you're wondering what's going on. One moment uh, you're in the middle of a storm. One moment you are, you're, you're having these extreme highs. Uh, another moment you're having extreme lows when you see the pain and the suffering where you're wondering, man, that guy got healed, but what about the rest of these people that, that didn't get healed around? Uh, there, there has to be something going on here. And so the disciples are just like you and me. They're growing and they're maturing, and and they don't understand everything yet. They don't have the Holy Spirit like we have today yet because Jesus hasn't gone to the Father. And so they're, they're going through all these experiences, and it says they were amazed, but as well they were afraid. And then Jesus pulls them aside, and on their way to Jerusalem, it starts to tell them what's about to happen. Verse 33, Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem. This is Jesus speaking to disciples. And the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and to the scribes, and they will condemn him to death, and deliver him to the Gentiles. And they will mock him and scourge him, and they will spit on him and kill him, and the third day he will rise again. So he tells them exactly what is about ready to happen. He says, guys, I'm going to go to the cross. I'm going to be beaten. I'm going to be bloodied. I will be murdered at the hands of the Gentiles. It's not looking very good until he ends with, and on the third day he will rise again. Now, the disciples in the natural are a lot like you and a lot like me. I don't don't know about you all the time, but I know about me, right? There are times where I hear something from the Word of God, that that God gives me some sort of a a revelation or shows me something to come, and I miss the point. Anybody ever have that happen to them other than Pastor Dan? Okay, thank you for the... 12 honest people in the building. The rest of you guys, we're, we're, we're growing, right? We're growing, all right? Now, the disciples missed the point. How do I know that? Let's continue to read on and find out why I know that. Verse 35, then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him saying, teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. In other words, they heard something 
about Jesus suffering and dying, but he says, I'm going to raise again on the third day. So they got a picture of Jesus, who they know is the Messiah, who they've seen approved by signs and wonders and miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit that have been poured out on him. And now all of a sudden they say, we want you to do whatever we ask. I would think that if Jesus was saying this, the proper response should have been, man, that's terrible. You're going to suffer. You're going to be mocked. You're, you're going to be crucified. You're going to die. No, they don't. They skip right over that. They go to the glory and they say, we want you to do whatever we ask. Obviously missing the point. Now, to make a bad situation worse, in the other gospels, you will find out that mama was the one that brought the boys over to Jesus and wanted to know about what they're about ready to ask, okay? So, just keep that in mind for a second, all right? And it goes on, it says in verse 36, and he said to them, what do you want me to do for you? See, Jesus is wise. He didn't say okay. He didn't say yes first. He said, what do you want? Before I'm going to do anything, I need to find out what it is. Some, some parents in this place say, amen, I got that wisdom from God. Verse 37, right? Verse 37, they said to him, grant us that we may sit one on your right hand and the other on your left in your glory. Jesus, you're going to be raised from the dead, and because we know that you're going to be raised from the dead and you're going to glory, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. Right off the bat, when Jesus starts talking about his ascension and his glorification, the very first thing they do is they say, Jesus, it's okay for you to be in the position of priority in the highest place, but we just want to be number two. We will be content, Jesus, if you just let us be number two. And, we, and you know, we, we won't even, you know, fight about it. One on the right, one on the left, we're good. It's all good, Jesus, if we can just be right underneath you, and then the rest of the peoples down there, the little peoples, they can all be underneath us, right? You'll be first, Jesus, but, but we want to be right there next. One on the right, one on the left. Thank goodness Jesus didn't say okay first, right? Verse 38, but Jesus said to them, you do not know what you ask. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? Now remember, he just told them, I'm going to suffer, going to be mocked, going to be scourged, going to be crucified. Now he says, are you able to do what I'm about ready to do? Verse 39, they said to them, we're able. These guys have a very high opinion of themselves. They think that they can do what Jesus is about ready to do. Now, before we get down on them, look at Jesus' response. Look at what he says. He says, you will indeed drink the cup that I drink, and with the baptism I am baptized with, you will be baptized. So he says, the Holy Ghost has been poured out on me. He's going to be poured out on you. And guess what? I'm going to suffer. I'm going to be crucified, mocked, scourged. I'm going to die. Both of you boys are going to go through some trials, going to go through some persecution. See, the hairs on the back of their neck should have been standing up when he said that. But they didn't realize the fullness of what he was saying. He says, you guys are going to go through some stuff, and yes, you will receive the Holy Spirit. Verse 40, but to sit on my right hand and on my left hand is not mine to give, but it's for those for whom it is prepared. Now, I don't know who that is, all right? Uh, you can look in the book of Revelation and try and figure that out for yourself if you want to try and do that. But all we know is that that is not something that is given based on, let me just ask Jesus if, if I can be number two, okay? There's obviously an order in the kingdom, and there's something that's taking place here that Jesus is saying, this, this is not how it's going to be, guys. You can't just ask and get the number two position in the kingdom when I ascend. Now, I love verse 41, and when the ten heard it, hello, Come on, this is, this is the rest of the disciples. This is the rest of the crew that's been traveling for three years with Jesus, right? And they've all been kind of on the level playing field. They were all sent out two by two. They were all sent out with the 70. They had all been there the whole time. They had all seen everything that Jesus had done. They would all traveled the same road. And now these two boys with their mama are going to ask Jesus to be ruler over us. When the 10 heard it, they began to be greatly displeased with James and John. I think that was putting it mildly, greatly displeased. There's a bunch of fishermen, some tax collectors, a zealot. I mean, you, you've got to imagine they were reaching for their swords, right, while these guys were talking, man. Gritting their teeth, clenching their fists. Man, when we get back to the tent tonight, mm, I'm going to give them something. You know, we're going to have one of those hazing parties. Something's going to go down later on. Verse 42, but Jesus called them to himself 
See, Jesus knew what was going on, and he knew the hearts of his followers. And don't you know that today, that when we start to think of ourselves more highly than we ought to, Jesus knows our hearts too. And he knows how to get us into a position. Jesus will take us aside and speak tenderly to us, give us his wisdom. And tonight, maybe for you, maybe it's just like me, we start to think of ourselves too highly. And maybe tonight's one of those nights where the Holy Spirit is just giving you a little correction, maybe a little adjustment like we prayed, you know, that, that if we're off course, God, that you would get us on course. Jesus called them to himself, and he said, you know that those who are considered rulers over the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. Verse 43, yet it shall not be so among you. In other words, there's a different kingdom that we live in. We do not live in the kingdoms of this world. Yes, we live in the United States of America. Yes, we are a part of, uh, you know, the world system that's here. We are in the world, but we are not of the world. And therefore, as Christians, we have to have a different mindset. We have to have a kingdom mindset. And Jesus says, it will not be so among you. In other words, your rulers will not be people who lord their authority over others. Sitting at the right hand and the left hand right? Like they had asked. And then being indignant as the other 10 because of something that somebody else did, now all of a sudden we're going to hold that over their heads and cause them guilt and shame for the rest of their life, never letting up. No, he says, it shall not be so among you, but whoever desires to become great among you shall be your servant. Jesus just flips the script, doesn't he? He, he takes things and he makes them so contrary to the way we would think. If you want a desire to be great, we would think, in order to be great, man, I've got to climb the highest mountain. I've got to sing the best song. I've got to do the best uh, job. I've got to have the most money. I've got to accumulate the most stuff. And yet Jesus says, whoever desires to be great, if you want to head to the top, the way up is down. Whoever desires to be great among you must become your servant. Remember the title of tonight's message? Others. Whoever desires to be great must become your servant. You've got to put others above yourself. Verse 44, and whoever of you desires to be first shall be slave of all. Man, we all desire to be first, don't we? Don't we want to be the ones recognized? I mean, that started when we were kids in school. Man, some, you knew the answer, your hands shot up, and you were just praying that the teacher would call on you. And you're out there in the schoolyard, right? And, and it's a game, man. You've got your ball. You've got your shorts on, socks pulled up to your knees if you were in the 80s like I was, right? Maybe the 70s, you got the big socks and that sort of thing. And so, man, you were ready to go, and you were hoping that the team captain, the cool kid, would pick you. It happens all the time, right? Get our first job, and, and, and a promotion, an opportunity comes up, and, man, you're flipping burgers the best you can. Why? Because you're hoping that they see how hard you're working, What does Jesus say? He says, whoever desires to be first must become slave of all. The way up is down. So contrary to the way we think, and yet we're operating not of this world. We're operating in the kingdom of Jesus. Therefore, we've got to listen up to what he says. Verse 45, for even the Son of Man, now he uses himself as an example. Even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for money. See, Jesus came and he modeled for us what the perfect human life ought to look like. Not only did Jesus come and he show us the Father and reveal to us the heart of the Father, he is the image of the invisible God and the brightness of his glory, the book of Hebrews says. So in Jesus, we can see the Father. But remember that Jesus has a dual nature. He is 100% God, and he's also 100% man. So not only did he model for us the image of the Father and show us what God looks like on the earth, he also, in his dual nature, showed us what the perfect man should look like. In other words, in Jesus' expression, in Jesus' servanthood, in Jesus' life, when you look at the way that Jesus lived, you can find out how you and how I ought to live our lives. Wow. That's pretty cool. You know, that's, that's so cool because now all of a sudden, it takes the guesswork out of it. See, sometimes we wonder as people, should I be a certain way? Should I do a certain thing? How should I act when it comes to life? What if somebody interrupts me? What if somebody's rude to me? I I mean, 
aren't I justified in saying, no, I, I, I don't got time for that, or I, I can't be there right now, or, or, or you know, you've been, you've been mean and ugly to me, and, 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 you know, fool me once, shame on you, fool me twice, shame on me, right? And yet when we see Jesus being interrupted, when we see Jesus being persecuted and mocked, and he didn't open his mouth one time, when we hear Jesus saying to forgive not just up to seven times, but seven times 70 every day. Oh my goodness. Now all of a sudden we see not only the heart of the Father, but we see the perfect man. We see that Jesus came and he laid down his life, not for things, not for position. He already had it. Not for priority. He's the preeminent one. He was the first and he's the last. He is the alpha and the omega. He didn't need any of that. He came and he laid down his life for others. William Booth, the uh, founder of the Salvation Army, he was holding an international convention, and uh, he couldn't attend the convention that they were holding because of sickness. And so in his absence at that time, they didn't have video feeds or anything like that, and so he decided he was going to wire his message to the convention. His message was one word. You know what that word was? Others. See, in our lifetime, if we follow Jesus, if you start to imitate Jesus, if you start to emulate Jesus, if Jesus gets on the inside of you, then Jesus is going to start living his life in and through you as you're faithful and faith-filled about the Word of God. And as you see what Jesus does, all of a sudden it starts to pour out of your life and you start to become a servant of others. Life only becomes great when it's offered in service to others. Oh, come on, somebody. That's, that's good right there. That, that's something to write down. That's something to memorize. That's something to make part of your life. Life only becomes great when it's offered in service to others. See, Jesus lived a great life. In fact, Jesus lived the greatest life that ever could have been lived. And Jesus' life was given in service to others. And now here he is speaking to his disciples, but it's preserved in Scripture for thousands of years so that you and I could read it today and find out how to live our lives. And he says, if you want to become great, then you should become slave of all. That means that life only becomes great when it's offered in service to others. So we need to consider others. We need to consider others. Who do we consider? Well, what about considering the lost? There's a lot of others out there that don't have Jesus in their heart and life. There's a lot of people out there that if they were to die tonight, they would die and they would go to hell for eternity. There's a lot of other people out there who are deceived and they're in the trap and the snare of the devil and they don't even know it, therefore they won't ever try and get out. We need to consider others and we need to serve people out there in the world without looking down our noses at them. Listen, guys, I am so guilty of this at times where you see people, you see their foolishness, you see their activities. I mean, I I took my kids to Disneyland the other day, and I'm looking around at others going, what are all these others thinking, you know? But if I get the heart of God for others, Jesus died for those people. Jesus died for people that would spit in his face. Jesus died for people that would mock him. Jesus died for people that would beat him and punch him and pull out his beard. Jesus died for people that wouldn't understand. Jesus died for people that would never repent. That that right there shocks me. That right there moves me. Because that means there's going to be people that we come across in our lifetime that we will minister to, that we will serve, we will preach to, we will share with them, we will give, we'll be generous, we'll be kind, and they still won't repent, and they still won't ever receive Jesus. But at least we considered others just like Jesus did. And we lived our life just like he did. We need to consider others. In fact, the word gives us, uh, you're there in Mark, turn back to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter number 5, that Jesus is speaking to the Sermon on the Mount. Very familiar scripture. But think about it when we're talking about others. Matthew chapter 5, verse number 16, look at what he says. He says, let your light so shine before men that they they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Notice what Jesus says. He says, let your light shine. Let your light be apparent about what you're all about. 
turn the light on. You got Jesus, who's the light of the world on the inside of you. You need to let your light shine. You need to be a witness. You need to consider other people. And he says, so that they may see your what? Oh, come on. You guys didn't leave the room already, did you? Fall asleep tonight? Listen, no sleeping. Come on. Time to wake up. All right, this is an interactive sermon. You got to talk to me, okay? Let your light so shine before men that they may see your what? Good works. In other words, we ought to be out there serving people. We ought to be out there loving people. We ought to be out there laying down our lives for people. We ought to be out there praying for people. We ought to be out there encouraging people. We ought to be out there sweeping the streets so that when people come to pick up food, they've got a clean environment. We ought to be lining up the baskets and lining up the boxes for people. We ought to be out there with the outreach ministries on Saturday going and telling someone about Jesus. We ought to be serving in church so that when lost people come in and we say, welcome home, this is your church, man. This is a great place. You're going to get encouraged. God's going to speak to you today. They'll look at you like you're crazy, but they'll be happy. Why? Because we're considering others, not just considering ourselves. You know, God forbid this church ever become a church where we come and we just consume and consume and consume. Feed me, pastor. Feed me, right? Just get bloated and yeah, you're built, but man, you're, you're, you're never using your muscles. You're never exercising your faith, and your muscles atrophy, and now all of a sudden you're weak, even though we're large. Listen, I'd rather be lean and mean. Come on. Come on. Amen? Then have a church that's asleep and not doing anything. This church is doing something. That's why I keep pointing it out every time that the announcements go off. This church is doing something. Why are we bringing in people from around the world? Why would we bring in a celebrity or a sports star who's got a good testimony? Why would we do that? Here's why. Because there are men out there that are just dumb, and, and they would never step foot in a church because they're too stubborn and too pig-headed. But the moment they hear baseball, oh, yeah, I'll come to church. Who's going to be there? Oh, yeah. Come on, let's go. And then tell them there's going to be food vendors. Get, get a meal for five bucks, man. The way to a man's heart is right through his stomach, okay? Tell them you're buying. You've really got them. Some of you ladies, I want my husband to get saved. Give him some money and say there's food and a baseball star going to be at the Rock. You need to go. We'll do the rest. Amen. That's why we're bringing in women from around the world to minister to the ladies at the conference that's coming up. This church is doing something. Why? To get people into the building so that they can have an encounter with God, so that they can hear the gospel preached, and so that they can give their eyes, they, that they may see your light shine and glorify God. We need to consider others. In our consideration of others, we also need to consider the lost. John chapter 13, verse 35, Jesus said this, By this, all will know that you are my disciples. If you have love, for who? One another. Others, right? You know, if people can see love flowing through us, God is love, right? And if it's a genuine, sincere, real love, I mean, they have tasted the fake love. They have drunk that thing down to its dregs, if you will. People understand what fake love is all about. People know when you're just loving them to get something out of them. People know the fake love. People have seen celebrities, oh, I love all my little people. Oh, I love all my fans. They, they can sniff that fakeness out in a moment. And yet when somebody encounters and tastes real love, when all of a sudden they see people that have a real friendship, a real bond, real unity, when they experience real family. You know why most people are in gangs out there in the world? Because they never had a family, so they wanted to be a part of something. They wanted to feel like they were connected to others. You know, we could solve the gang problem just by being more loving. Because I'll tell you something, you know, people come into church and they feel like they're judged because they got tattoos or because they're wearing weird, funny clothes, you know. And yet if we can welcome people in, that's one of the things I love about this church, man. I, I just got welcomed by an usher the other day with a, a tattooed kiss on his cheek and tats going up his neck and all that kind of stuff. I mean, and, and, and that lady was just, you know, I'm kidding. It was a man. <laughs> kidding. But I've seen some of you ladies, man, full sleeves and all that kind of stuff. I love it. 
Why? Because someone's going to come into this church, and they're going to look around, they're going to see somebody in a suit over here. Then they're going to look over here, and they're going to see somebody with some joggers on. They're going to look over here, and they're going to see somebody with some tats. They're going to look over here, and they're going to see some guy with a bald head. And then they're going to look over there, and, and, and they're going to just say, I belong. Why? Because there's people that look like me, and there's people that don't look like me, and we're all here together. But the biggest thing is that they love somebody. They love somebody. This church is a godly, loving church that loves people to life. Listen, we, we, we won't leave you alone. We'll bug you. Oh, I'll tell you that right now. We will get in your face with the Word of God, and we'll tell you so that, why? So that we can change. But while you're in that process, oh my goodness, we will love you. We'll be patient, long-suffering, and kind. We'll be merciful to you. We'll be structuring with that mercy, right? Don't mess around, okay? We'll, we'll love you, but you, you're going to have to go on with God. You're going to have to grow with God. We'll force you into those arenas of life. But we're going to consider others, considering the lost. Second thing is this, consider the believers. Did you know you have permission from the Word of God to play favorites? I'm not kidding. We have permission from the Bible to play favorites. You know who my favorite is? Jesus told me who my favorite is. It's all of you. Why? Because you're believers. And there's a word in the Bible called especially, right? That means that that is especial, if I could say it in espanol. Especially. Especially means that I love everybody, but especially means there's a cherry on top, right? That's, that's the higher place. That's, that's where I'm going to put a little bit more attention and some more interest into it. I love the loss. I will lay down my life and serve the loss, but especially when it comes to considering others, I'm going to consider the believers. Let's take a look at this word. Look at what it says. It says in Galatians chapter 6, turn there with me, Galatians chapter number 6. Okay, I'm going to show this to you in your Bible. You have permission to favor other believers. Galatians chapter 6, verse number 10 says, Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all. Right? So everybody. Believers, non-believers, people we like, people we don't like, uh, people we're comfortable with, people we're uncomfortable with. Right? Everybody. As we have opportunity, do good. So when you see the opportunity, go for it. Okay? But look at the next word. Look at what it says especially, oh, that means I can give some priority. That means I can give a little bit extra to this, right? He says, especially to those who are of the household of faith. So, you know, you got a cookie, and there's a believer and an unbeliever, and you say, you guys want some? Yeah, and you break it in half. You can give the bigger piece to the believer, and then when the unbeliever says, why'd you give him the big piece? Yeah, he's my brother in Christ. If you were a brother in Christ, I would have been a little bit more, you know. I'm kidding. <laughs> kidding. Come on, give the big piece to the unbeliever. They need to see your good works, all right? You guys are taking me way too seriously tonight. Lighten up. Come on, loosen up. Okay? Slug your neighbor. No, don't slug your neighbor, all right? You don't know them. If you know them, you can slug them. First Peter chapter 4. Turn there with me towards the end of your Bible. First Peter chapter 4. We just lost all the unbelievers on the live feed. <laughs> Church is not loving. Bunch of hypocrites. First Peter chapter 4, verse 10. Especially, you can favor other believers, though. You know what I mean? You should have a fervent love. You should be able to do good to other believers. Man, you, this, this guy, Elijah, over here on the keyboards, this guy is a crack up. Um, I used to have a secretary named Sarita. Sarita used to, and Sarita, if you're watching on the live stream, I love you dearly, and you're my Best, best, best ever. You're just wonderful. Serena, many of you guys know her. Um, she, she was just the best around here. You couldn't have a birthday or an anniversary or a Friday without Sarita doing something nice for you. It was just like, you just knew Sarita was lurking around some corner waiting to like throw confetti on you and have a cake and like, that's just how Sarita was. Okay, when Sarita left, we were all so sad because she got married, she moved to Texas, got a job and all that kind of stuff, and she's out there with her family, and, and she's just doing good, but, uh, you know, she's got a good church out there and doing great, but this guy Elijah over here, he is the new Sarita around this place, and I mean, like, if, if you ever hear, like, shouts of joy, like, back in the music room in between the first and second service, it's because they're having a birthday party, or they're having an anniversary celebration, or they're having a Sunday special or something. I don't know. You know, they're just going nuts back there because he's favoring 
the brethren. He's creating moments. He's creating family. And that's how church ought to be. It ought to be like, man, what happened? Why are they being so nice to me? Well, because you're a brother in the Lord. And this is what family does for one another. Rather than divide, rather than say, oh, you you know what, I'm just going to go sit and get the download, right? And then I'm going to go home and do nothing about it. No, let's do good. Let's love one another. Let's treat each other like we care. Come on, somebody. Can you say amen to that? You say, well, I don't know how am I supposed to do that. I don't know if I can afford that, Pastor. Here, here's how you do it. First Peter chapter 4, you there? Verse number 10. As each one has received a gift. Maybe you didn't know, but when you got saved, you got the Holy Ghost on the inside of you. Okay? And as you got the Holy Spirit of God, Jesus, the Bible says, gave gifts unto man. Now, in the, in the context of that, it's talking about the five-fold ministry gifts, but as well, there are spiritual gifts that are poured out on you. And those are empowered when you're baptized in the Holy Spirit. Now, all of a sudden, you receive the power to do ministry, to be a witness. You receive the baptism of love, right? You are now encompassed by the Spirit. But as well, there are spiritual gifts that have been given by the Spirit of God that are now graces in our lives. They're divine abilities on our behalf when we can't do it. So now all of a sudden God says, as each one has received a gift, okay, you have received a gift. Look at what it says. Minister it to one another. Now the word minister, oftentimes we think of it like the minister was preaching today. That is not the real translation of minister, okay, or ministry. Do you know that ministry simply is this, service for others. That's what ministry is. So if I'm a minister of the gospel, I am a servant who brings the gospel to other people. As the minister, my, my ministry is I have a teaching gift that God has given to me, and that's why I minister with the Word of God. But whatever gift you've been given, maybe some of you guys have been given a gift of administration, and, and you understand how things work, you see the big picture, you connect dots, that sort of thing. The Bible says you need to minister that, that to the church, minister it to one another. Some of you guys have been given a gift of exhortation. You just know how to encourage. You just know how to smile. You just know how to say, hey, you you look great today. Man, I'm so excited that you're here. Like my brother Dennis over here on the front row, he's smiling. He's got a gift of exhortation. He's the greatest greeter I have ever seen in my entire life. And there are people that go to this church that they look at the doors And when they find Dennis's door, that's the one they go to because they know they're going to feel good when they walk through his door because Dennis is going to say, hey, today is the day that the Lord has made. I'm doing fantabulous today. You're looking good. It's good to see you in the house of God. See, as each one has received a gift, you can minister it to one another. Maybe you've got a gift of hospitality. Maybe you've got that gift to just cook and serve up and you can make a table and a spread and somebody feels special about that. Whatever gift God has given to you, the Bible says that you have permission to minister it one to another. Then it goes on and it says, verse number 10, as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. See, it's a gift of God. Verse 11, if anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracle of God. If anyone ministers, let him do it as with the ability which God supplies, that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belong the glory and the dominion forever and ever. See, the Lord is telling us that we need to love one another and that we need to minister whatever gift he's given to us to one another. You've received a gift. You have what it takes to consider others, considering the lost, loving people to life, and then considering one another. Now, the last consideration that I want you to consider is this, is that you need to consider your leaders. And and I should have in parentheses your pastors, okay? Not just me, not just Pastor Dan, not just Pastor Jim or the teaching team, Pastor Luke, that sort of a thing. But the pastors that are here, the leaders that are here. Consider your leaders. There's a scripture in the Bible that uh, I've come across that It's very interesting. I want to show it to you. Okay, I'll read it to you, and then we'll talk about it. Hebrews, the 13th chapter. In in our Sunday morning studies, we just uh, wrapped up Hebrews, the 11th chapter, so we got chapter 12. So in about uh, six years, we'll be in Hebrews, the 13th chapter, at the pace we're going. Hebrews, chapter 13, verse number 17. Look at what it says. It says, Obey those who rule over you, and be submissive, for they watch out for your souls, as those who must give account. Let them do so with joy and not with grief, for that would be unprofitable for you. Now, when I say consider your leaders, here's, here's the thought, okay? 
is that as leaders, we're encouraging you guys. Oftentimes you'll hear us saying, man, we're going to do this. We're going to go here. We're going to be this. We're going to, you know, grow. We're going to continue to reach out, you know. And there are things that we ask you guys to get on board with. You know, we just wrapped up our Freedom for Our Future campaign. We were asking you guys to get on board financially to help pay down the mortgage on this church. And we did a great job with that. And we're continuing to do that into the future. And so we'll ask you guys from time to get on board with vision or whatever it is that we're doing. We're going out to, you know, Paris Hill Park and to be handing out backpacks. If you guys would serve, you know, or, or the ladies are having an event. Men, let's get together and let's help them out. Or the men are having an event. Ladies, let's get together and help them out. See, we will ask you guys for things. We will ask you guys to get on board as well. Like I mentioned in our preaching and teaching, we'll get in your face. It's time to change. It's time to grow. We're not going to be stingy. We're not going to be greedy. We're, we're going to be loving. We're going to be kind. We're going to flow with the gifts of the Spirit. We're going to have the fruit of the Spirit, you know? And, and we'll be giving you guys these messages, and, and not just information, but inspiration from the Holy Spirit about your life. Now, look at what it says. It says, obey those who rule over you and be submissive. Submissive means readily obedient to what you've heard, okay? That you are coming under what it is that you hear. So that's sub, right? A, a submarine, we understand, goes under the water. So submissive means coming under the mission that's being laid out from your leadership, whether that's in Breaking Free or whether that's with SPT or whether that's with children's or youth ministries, whatever it is. He says, obey them and be submissive. And then it goes on and it says, for they watch out for your souls as those who must give account. We as pastors and leaders are going to go before God one day and yes, we will stand before God alone when it comes to our lives and judgment about what we did. But as stewards, and then specifically, there's another, a stricter judgment for teachers of the Word of God. So there is a stricter judgment that comes with that because we give an account for what we taught and we give an account for what we told people to do and what happened. So therefore, it says, be submissive because they answer to God for your life. You're not answering to God for my life. I'm answering to God for yours, the same way the leadership is. Now that scares, puts a fear, right? A, a, a reverential respect and an awe and, and, and a fear of God in me about how I lead and what I say from this pulpit. So there's a respect level that comes with this. But then it goes on and says, let them do so with joy and not with grief, for that would be unprofitable, not for them, for you. In other words, when you start to consider your leaders, when you start to consider your pastors and those who minister the word of God to you or those who are leading you in ministry, and when you say, hey, is that what we're doing? Then let's go. When you say, hey, I heard the word and I'm applying it to my life. Hey, if that's the mission of this church and that's where we're going, then I'm on board. You can count me in. All of a sudden it says that, that doesn't just make the preacher happy. It doesn't just make the leader put a smile on their face. It says that profits you. Wow. You know why? Because when we go before God, and when we give on our account of the people that were in our church, and they say, hey, what about Joe? Oh, Joe is the best. Yeah, Joe did everything we asked. We, in fact, there was stuff Joe did we never had to ask him about. Well, what about Susie? Well, Susie was great. Man, Susie was awesome. Su Susie was, was readily submitted. See, all of a sudden, you've got a commendation before the Father as we're given in our account. It says it's profitable for your life. And listen, we're not telling you to do anything that goes against what God wants for your life. We're encouraging you in godliness and good things. So the more you do what we say, the more you're getting the results from the Word of God. Now that doesn't mean just blindly do whatever we say. That means check it out with the Word of God. And if you see it, you hear it, then hey, they're my leader. They're asking for this. Then that's where we're going and that's what we're doing. Consider your leaders. I would encourage you that if you don't have the vision yet, you should get the vision. Because otherwise, you're going to end up in division. You're going to end up doing your own thing. Start speaking the vision. That's why at the end of every church service, we shout out together, the Inland Empire shall be saved. Why? That's the vision. Our heart is for people. Our heart is for others at this church. I heard one, people, one, one church tell their people, if you're not helping, you're not helping. It's kind of a thought, isn't it? But we need to have that mindset that says, you know what? I, I'm going to be submissive to my leaders. I'm going to consider the brethren I'm going to love people in the church. And guess what else? I'm going to consider the lost. Because that's what we're all about, is one word, others. You know, God is concerned with people. So much so that he sent Jesus, beaten, bloody, and hung on a cross. Jesus died for people. But you know who else is interested in people? The angels. In fact, you'll find in the, the book of 1 Peter, it says that angels desire to look into the things of salvation. They're interested in people. But you know who else is interested in people is the devil. 
The Bible says that the devil is going to and fro, that he's searching for those whom he may devour. And so if God is considerate of people, if the angels are considerate of people, and if the devil is looking out for people, how much should we give our lives in service to others? Service for people that Jesus died for. Today, if you get nothing else, get the title of the message. One word that as you meditate on it, allow the Spirit of God to move you. It will make all the difference in your life. That one word is others. You guys got something from the word of the Lord. Would you give God a hand?